Hey man, good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Righteous Living Ministries. I'm Pastor Richard Rosenthal. And I'm Pastor Stephanie Rosenthal. And we're so glad that you can be with us this morning for mm-hmm. service. We just mm-hmm. want to say happy holidays to you. We know that Christmas is coming on Friday of this week, and we nice. wish you all a very Merry Christmas. Yes. And before we go any further, we're going to open up with a word of prayer from Pastor Stephanie. Amen. Lord God, we come before you on this morning, blessing you and honoring you and thanking you for the gift through your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, O oh Father God, again and again for life more abundantly through your son who came and died for our sins, who paid that price for us, that ultimate price that we may once again have communion with you. And we thank you, Lord God. And right now in this moment, for despite whatever has happened throughout this week, Lord God, right now, this moment, re, we reunite with you, Lord God. We reunite and give your name all glory and honor, all praise, oh Father God. We bless your holy, your mighty, your wonderful name, your matchless works, oh Father God. We keep before our eyes so that we honor you and glorify you because there is none greater than you. There is none wiser than you. There is none more mighty than you. And we give you praise. We bless you, Lord God. And we pray in the name of Jesus that this day be just the beginning of something great in you. Let us, oh Father God, yield our vessels to be used by you so that someone on today be blessed because we allowed you to use us and we'll just continue to give your name glory and honor in your mighty son jesus name we bless you amen amen thank you pastor stephanie for that prayer and now for our amen amen many of us may feel like those two the man and the woman writing their dear christmas letter because we may go through the ongoing routine during this holiday season, getting gifts for one another, which is special. It is good to give gifts and it feels good to give gifts, but still have an empty feeling in our hearts. We may go through different kinds of things as far as even with this pandemic and we may be going through some different struggles in our lives with maybe some of us have lost a job and having to social distance and just not being able to do the things that we want to do and that we once liked to do like some of us are still not congregating in churches some of us decided not to go see one another for thanksgiving just to try to uh, stop the spread of the virus and who knows maybe some of us may not even visit family members like we normally do during christmas this year but then there might be some things that God is trying to get our attention with in this pandemic. Maybe we have uh, looked at many other things in life and put our trust in those things. Maybe we looked at a person and thought that that person who was in our lives was our hope, and now they're no longer in our lives. Maybe we looked at our jobs and thought that our jobs was our security only to get a pink slip and to see that our employer wasn't as dedicated to us as we were to them. Maybe we've had a child to go astray. Maybe we had the death of a loved one who meant so much to us and it just got us to feel empty at this point in time. I remember a personal story that I'd share with you is that there was one point in time in my life where I was the happiest that I had ever been. And it was the wedding day that I married my wife. Boy, I was so happy because I finally had gotten out of the the rigmarole and the, the ups and downs in relationships and I finally met someone who I could be with for the rest of my life. But something happened, brothers and sisters. And what happened was one day I was lying in bed. This was about after about four to five years of being married to my wife. And something had come over me. 
I was laying on my back. My wife was next to me, sound asleep. And tears just started running down my eyes profusely. Running so much so that it was running down my face and on my neck because I was laying on my back. But I just could not understand why I was crying. I was not I was not sad. I was happy. I was married to my wife. We hadn't had children yet. But this sort of feeling came over me and I could not explain it. And so I began to, to, to speak to God and I know that it was him speaking to me all that time. And I said, Lord, there's nothing wrong. I'm not sad. Why am I crying like this? Why are these tears just coming down my face? And I really don't have anything that I'm sad about. I got a job. I'm making good money. And my wife has a job. She's doing well. We're making ends meet. Why am I crying like this? And the Lord spoke to me in such a still, small voice. And he said, simply, you are experiencing joy for the very first time. That was monumental in my life because I thought the happiest day in my life up until that point was the day that I married my wife. But it wasn't. And that was so surprising to me until I started developing my relationship with God. That's when he started lining up different things in my life that may not have still been all together even after my marriage. And so what God was simply speaking to me was that he was happy that now I truly am following him and that now my life is on the direction that he had, that he had made for me before time began. Now today, when we look in this word, we're going to be looking at how God has done something to make certain that all of us have an opportunity to connect to his decision, to connect to his will for each and every one of our lives. And it has to come to a moment where you may be laying on your back in your bed and crying profusely with tears coming down your eyes. Maybe he might catch you at your job. Maybe he might speak to you when you're riding in your car. Maybe he might speak to you when you're at your lowest point in life. But he does have to have that conversation with you so that you can see and appreciate what was already done for us in life. And so what we're going to do is we're going to turn to the second chapter of Luke today. We're going to be looking in the gospel of Luke to see why we should all have come to a point to experience this joy that I'm speaking of today. And so what I would like for you all to do is please turn with me to the second chapter of Luke. And I'm going to be reading verses 8 through 14 out of the New International Version. That's Luke chapter 2, reading verses 8 through 14 out of the New International Version. And it reads as thus. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those whom his favor rests. 
May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, hearing, understanding, and applying of his word. I'd like to speak from this topic this morning. Joy made complete. Joy made complete. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for our opportunity to hear your word. Now, Father, I pray that your spirit be in this place. I pray that you come down and manifest your word through me so that it be able to touch the hearts of everyone that may be listening today or at a later date. Father, we praise your holy name and just ask that your words be clear to us today. Let us understand what you want us to know about your son, Jesus. And Father, give us a new revelation where, there, where a new revelation is needed. And Father, let those who are on the fence of understanding who you are and what Jesus' birth means to us, resonate with them at a new level so that they want to have and experience the joy that we hear about in your word. Experience the joy that many other Christians can experience even through the trials of life. Now, Father, I thank you. I pray that you be the speaker of this word today. Father, begin to let your Holy Spirit cover me now and begin to speak through me as I try my best to give your word to your people. Father, this is my prayer on today. In your precious son, Jesus name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, this book that Luke is writing here, he's actually writing to the believers to give them strength that there is coming a Messiah. And one of the things when we look at the book of Luke in comparison to all the four gospels, his book is the more comprehensive. It is more comprehensive because he wants to give a detailed overview of why they should have faith and why they should be encouraged about what Jesus Christ did for us and giving them an idea of what was done for us through Jesus Christ. He wanted to encourage them. Now, most of us, if not all of us, would accept encouragement because there are just some times where the different trials in life may hit us unexpectedly and it gets us to a point where we lose all hope and even our faith may be questioned because of what we're experiencing at that time is so difficult to bear that it just causes us to need some encouragement at that time. So even in a particular season, we may sometimes need to be lifted up, even some of the greatest of us who profess the name of the Lord. And so see, because there's an understanding by Luke, because Luke is a very smart man. In fact, Luke was a physician. He's probably one of the most, was the most intelligent of the gospels, which is why he was able to write with such degree of proficiency, with such degree of just comprehensiveness because of his portrayal of Jesus personification. Now, this again, because of the encouragement that we sometimes need, is essentially why Luke was writing his book to Theophilus. He was writing to Theophilus, but even though he was writing to this particular person, this book can be read. This gospel can be read as if it was written to all of us who believe. It is a detailed version again of Jesus's life and his personification and his birth on earth. And through his detailed narrative, it compels a countenance of joy to overtake all of us who believe in Jesus Christ. So then brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters I encourage us today to be just as joyful as the shepherds were when the angel had spoke to them that there is 
the Messiah that is born, to be just as joyful as they were because there are several instances in the Bible throughout history that points to Jesus Christ's birth, that points to the Messiah coming to save the world. Now, this is, should be something that should be joyful no matter who we are, no matter where we reside, no matter what country we live in, because again, this Christ's birth is for the entire world. And so we see here many instances that happened in the first century and beyond that would cause us to have this kind of joy. In one of the reasons, in one of the instances why we should have this kind of joy is because John the Baptist recognized Jesus from his mother's womb. Now let's move to the first chapter of Luke, if we will, reading the 42nd verse through the 45th verse. And this is how it reads. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promise to her. What we see in this scripture here is Mary visiting Elizabeth. Now, Elizabeth, right before Mary visits Elizabeth, the angel Gabriel, the angel Gabriel speaks to Mary, comes and lets her know that she is favored, that God has favor on her. And this is important in two reasons. This is important because the favor consists in its twofold because Mary was first not supposed to be able to have children, yet she is going to birth the Messiah. Again, the first blessing is now that she's going to give birth at her late age. And not only that, she is going to birth the Messiah. Then in chapter two, we see here, she's speaking to Elizabeth, who is actually also going to give birth in her later years to John the Baptist. And the baby that leaps in her womb is actually John the Baptist himself, because he is joyful that the mother who has favor, that the mother who was once barren, that the mother who was going to birth the Messiah, who he is going to prepare the way for, has come to visit his mother while yet he was still in the womb. Now, what we see here, even in the mother's womb, that there was discernment that John the Baptist had, knowing that this Savior was about to come. Now, when we have discernment, it is the ability to comprehend something that is obscure, the ability to comprehend something that is not comprehensible, the ability to comprehend something that is inconceivable, the ability to comprehend something that is not yet plain to the physical eye. And when we go back to Elizabeth, and when we go back to John the Baptist, while they were in the womb, they were believers in Jesus Christ before he had even been birthed. Before the forerunner, who is John the Baptist, was birthed, they had to be believers in who Jesus was in order to understand what the magnificent call that was on John's life to be able to prepare the way for the Messiah for Jesus. So what we see here is God is looking for someone today to have the same type of discernment, to have the same type of love, to have the same type of belief 
that John the Baptist had to have the same type of belief that Elizabeth, the mother, had to have the same type of belief that Mother Mary had that Jesus Christ was coming, to know that he was omnipotent, to know that he was omniscient, to know that he was the savior of the world is the same type of joy and the same type of belief and is the same type of joy that every Christian that believe has whenever we celebrate Christmas, whenever we celebrate this period, which makes us be able to raise the gift giving, which be able to help us raise the the marketing of all of the different kinds of gift that these retailers are looking for us to be able to place our trust, our hope, and our belief in those things and to make us feel like if we don't have it to give, that we are less than. But there's something greater about the birth of Christ. There's something greater that should give us joy. There's something greater that we must understand about the birth in more of a more recent time, in more of a more recent form when we see the birth of, when we see the birth of Jesus coming and we see how happy and we see how joyful not only was John the Baptist, not only was Elizabeth, his mother, but also Mary of his coming. So what we must do, brothers and sisters, is discern God's love for us and receive the same joy today that they had back then in the first century. Now, the next instance in history that pointed to the Messiah coming to save the world is this, is when Isaiah prophesied Jesus' personification 700 years prior to his birth. Now, let's look what Isaiah, the prophet, said in the 61st chapter in the 61st chapter, verses 1 through 3 out of the New International Version. And here's what the prophet had to say. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim the freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our Lord, of our God, to comfort all who mourn. Now, before I finish, Isaiah the prophet is talking about the Lord. Isaiah the prophet is talking about the Christ. Let me continue here because this is so good. Verse three, finishing up, it reads as thus, and provide those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Hallelujah. So here we have the prophet Isaiah. And what is the prophet Isaiah doing? The prophet Isaiah is prophesying to the people of Judah. The prophet Isaiah is prophesying to the people of of Judah back then, right before they were going to go into captivity. If you remember, the kingdoms were separated. And in fact, the kingdom of the, the northern kingdom, which was Israel, and the southern kingdom, which was Judah, Israel had already been overtaken by the Assyrians. Now, Isaiah is prophesying right around the time that Israel was about to be overtaken by the Babylonian ruler, Nebuchadnezzar. And what he is doing is he letting, he's letting them know that they need to have repentance in their lives. They need to repent 
from the day that they were starting to sin. And because of their sin, we see that they were sinning from the time they left Egypt, from the time when God was leading them by a, by a pillar of cloud in the day and a, and, a, and a flame of fire at night, they continued to sin. And so Isaiah had come. Isaiah was the prophet that God had appointed at that time to let them know that they needed to repent from their sin. But what Isaiah's prophecy was unique as well is he was unveiling that there was a Christ that was about to come. And this is where we see him speaking about Christ getting ready to come. And what Christ ultimately does, people of God, that is so beautiful and that aligns very beautifully with the prophecy of Isaiah is in the fourth chapter of Luke, specifically verses 18 and 19, when Jesus does finally manifest and he's walking the earth and he's fully human, he pulls out a scroll that was physically written by this prophet Isaiah in what I just read. That he pulls out this scroll that was physically preserved for Isaiah because of the prophecy that he had spoken 700 years before Christ had come. He had pulled out this scroll and read it to the people at that very time, almost verbatim to what Isaiah read, to what Isaiah prophesied in the 61st chapter, verses 1 through 3, and it is in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 through 19, where Christ recites exactly his coming that the prophet Isaiah was speaking about then. And so what we must see then is that when you repent, it is repenting, it's turning away from what you were bound by to remain committed to your walk with Christ, with your walk to what your spirit is getting ready to submit you to, is what the spirit of the holiness of Christ is wanting you to, is wanting you to now direct your life, is what the Holy Spirit is now wanting you to uh, turn your attention away from the flesh and to spiritual things. He is talking about the Christ 700 years before he had come. And then he not only again talks about salvation, which is deliverance from the power and the effects of sin. This is why we should have joy, brothers and sisters. This is why we should understand the beauty of what Christ's birth means to us. This is one of the reasons why we should have the same joy. This is one of the reasons why we should leap and know that every year, no matter how many years we are living, we should be happy. We should celebrate, not gift giving, even though that's a good thing. We should celebrate all of the things that Christ means to us because of his birth, because of what it means to us and how this inclusion represents our life and how it affects us in a positive way. So we must understand that during this season, it is not about the gift giving. During the season, we all may need to write a dear Christmas letter. We all may need to write a dear God letter. We all may need to write a dear Jesus letter to let him know that this is what mistakes we've made in celebrating Christmas in the wrong way. This is what mistakes we've made in celebrating Christmas thinking that I am less than because I don't have the financial wherewithal to get the gifts that I, to have the, the financial wherewithal to get the gifts that I'm trying to get or that I desire to get for people and to overlook the different things that Christ's life and coming as birthing mean to us here now, here forevermore. And so what we must do, brothers and sisters, is we must give glory to God for his goodness. Give glory to God for his understanding. Give glory to God for his ways and knowing that his mind and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. For giving his ideal, for giving the ways of us understanding now, looking in hindsight of what Jesus means to us today and how it carries us forward down in the future in our next generations. So we should celebrate Christ. We should celebrate his birth in a different way than these gifts, in a different way than thinking that we're less than because of what his birth means to us. And finally, brothers and sisters, the final occurrence in history that gave mankind an indication 
that a savior would be born is when the manifestation of salvation was initiated in the Garden of Eden by God. Here is God himself, brothers and sisters. This is a scripture that if you aren't aware of it, it's a scripture that you should always know to go to. You should always know this scripture to cling to, to even give us a better idea of the magnificence of God, of our all-knowing God, of our omniscient God, of a God who has our best interest at heart. Because what it says in Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 through 15, it reads as thus. So the Lord God said to the serpent, this is right after the fall of Adam and Eve, in the serpent deception. Continuing on, he says, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity. This is the verse that you want to watch that I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Hallelujah. This is a magnificent verse for many reasons because it is God himself initiating and speaking of salvation being initiated. And so what does that mean to us brothers and sisters? When we look over history, everything that was in Israel's history, even before Israel, everything that was in Abraham's history, everything that was in Moses' history, everything that was in Israel's history, everything that was in King David's history, Everything that was in Jacob's history, Isaac's history, everything that was in history points to the coming of the Messiah. It points to the coming of Christ being birthed to be the savior of all mankind. And when I say mankind, I am not speaking gender specific. I'm speaking of man and woman. I'm speaking of how Christ's birth and what it means to us and why we should be joyful. Because in the Garden of Eden is where the downfall happened. And it is also where the curse by God was given not only to the not only to Adam and Eve, but also to the serpent. See, God was initiating again salvation. He's telling the serpent that he will eventually be defeated. And the woman that he is talking about and the whose heel who he would be under is he would be under Christ's heel. He would be under Christ's foot. So as a believer and as Christ's birth coming and as what God was speaking to the serpent back then, to the serpent back when time could not be recorded, to back then to where the downfall, to where the curse and where the fall of Adam and Eve had happened and to where this curse has happened. We don't even know how far back that time was, but that is when salvation was being instituted when it, when it, when salvation was being initiated for Christ to come and then what we see brings us back up to the birth of Christ coming all of that time everything that has happened is now pointing to Christ's birth and so what essentially happens is what we must understand is this if all of these time periods point to Christ's coming, then God knew that if Adam and Eve, who had everything in the Garden of Eden, all they had to do was stay away from the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, 
everything was available to them. They did not have anything that they had need of, but the serpent deceived them and made them think they needed the tree. Doesn't deception happen to us today? He made them think that they needed more than what God already provided. Because again, as I always say, how could they need something when God already knew before they needed what they thought that they, that what they could even conceive in their mind, what they needed, God had already provided it for them. And so it is for us today, since they could not be faithful, since they could not be obedient, God had to institute a savior before he brought Abraham on the scene. God had to institute a savior before he brought Isaac and Jacob on the scene. God had to institute a savior before he brought all the offsprings of, of Jacob on the scene. God had to institute a savior before he told the children of Israel, before he sent apostle Paul to go and be a witness to the Gentiles, because not, not only was salvation open to just the Jews, it was now open to the Gentiles who you and I are, who you and I are because we are not Jews. And so now the Salvation has become inclusive because God knew at that time, at the fall of Adam and Eve, at the time of him giving the curse, that the Savior needed to be born. And so now we look here in the second chapter of Luke, which talks about the birth of Christ because it was already talked about by God. It was already, uh, it was already decided by God that this would happen have to occur because when we see this then we need it resuscitating and when you need to be resuscitated whether you are dead or you're living and you're dead then you need to be resuscitated from death or from unconsciousness now from those of us who are still living and you're hearing this message some of us may be unconscious spiritually because we do not have a connection with the Holy Spirit of God. We move along and we live our lives, maybe a void, maybe void of the Holy Spirit speaking to us. And maybe if the Holy Spirit is speaking to us, we are not being obedient to what the Holy Spirit is saying. And so there needs to be a resuscitation. And so he brings Christ. He brings the Holy Spirit to begin to infiltrate our vessels so that we can be able to live this life outright. Because if Adam and Eve couldn't do it, who had everything, surely you and I couldn't do it. So he brings the second and the third person of the Trinity and himself to be able to save us from our sinful ways. So this is what the birth of Christ means to us. This is why we be able to, we are able to say hallelujah, raise our hands to say, thank you, Jesus for being our savior. Thank you, God, for having all knowing, for having all understanding that we needed a savior, to have all understanding to know that the sins in our lives, the things that keep besetting us, that keeps allowing us to go after things that we ought not to, your Holy Spirit is here to help us through grace, which is the unmerited divine assistance given humans to re uh, to given humans for their regeneration or their sanctification. And so he sends this Christ. He sends his Holy Spirit to be able to assist us, brothers and sisters, where we need it the most. The areas only you the enemy in God knows that you fight with, that you struggle with. And so this birth means so much to us. And so we must understand that we have to let God be our burden barrier, be our burden bearer rather, and receive joy today. No matter what you're facing, no matter what you're going through, we have to know that what God did by sending Jesus Christ on the cross for us, it supersedes any pain that this world throws at us. It supersedes any issue that we might face in life. It supersedes any pandemic that we go through because this is not the first pandemic. It supersedes any 
illness that we might face. It supersedes any divorce that we might go through. It supersedes any relationship issue that we might be having a problem with. It supersedes any addiction that we might be connected to. It supersedes any job that we may have lost. It supersedes any issue in life that we struggle with because God knew that the pain and the toil and the issues in life we could not bear on our own. So he sent Jesus. He sent himself as an incarnate through Jesus Christ to help us for when we cannot help ourselves. So brothers and sisters, why did I share this this morning? Because we're in this season of Christmas. And we must understand what the true reason for the season is. Yes, it may sound cliche-ish, but the true reason of the season is Christ. Don't worry about if you don't have a job now and you can't make ends meet and you can't get the gifts that you want to. Maybe that's God's way of letting you know you don't want to go through that circle again of getting yourself in debt. When your New Year's resolution at the beginning of 2020 was to get out of debt. Maybe you're dealing with something else in your life that God just wants you to focus on him right now. Maybe God has closed up everything on us for us to not only understand that not only should we focus on God during this Christmas season, but through and during Christmas day, but on the all, all the other 364 days of the year and 365 days of the year, whenever there's a leap year. See, because one of the things that we have to understand then and what I'm trying to bring this message to is this. Christ's birth was the fullness of time coming at that point. And what is the full, fullness of time? The fullness of time is simply that something that you're waiting for, something that you desire, something that you long for will eventually come if you wait long enough for it. We waited through Abraham. We waited through Isaac. We waited through Jacob. We waited through all the Israel's downfall. We waited through the 400 years where God didn't speak anything from Malachi to Jesus' coming. We waited all that time and all of a sudden the fullness of time happens here with what Luke the gospel is talking about in the second chapter of Luke. And it's Jesus' birth. Can you imagine waiting from time period beyond we know that Abraham was around in 2100 BC. Now this fullness of time, if we want to put a time frame to what I am speaking of about fullness of time, we know it extends beyond 2100 BC. We are now in AD 2020 and it is about to be in AD 2021 here in a couple more weeks. So if you add those years together, that's well over 4,000 years on top of us not knowing how long ago was the curse placed and when God was initiating salvation that this fullness of time can be calculated. So the fullness of time is, un, is, is well longer than 4,000 years. The fullness of time is perhaps beyond our understanding when we understand that the earth, the earth age is 4.5 billion years old so we don't know when this was initiated but all we do know is that the fullness of time is happening here in the book of Luke the fullness of time in chapter 2 of the birth of Jesus is applying to you and I is, a, is, a, is, is supposed to be for you and I this fullness of time is what should give us joy this fullness of time is what should get us to understand understand that Christ and what he means to us and his birth and what it means to all of us, what it means to all humankind, no matter what our race, no matter what our age, no matter what our sex, it, it applies to each and every one of us. 
So this fullness of time should make us joyful. This is why Christians clap. This is why Christians say hallelujah. This is why Christians pray. This is why Christians have thanks. Because your pain will soon go away. Because your loneliness will soon dissipate. Because your health will no longer be an issue. Because your financial lack will be compensated for. Because your fear will become strength. Because your relationships will improve. Because your mindset will change for the better. Because your lifestyle will become righteous. Because Jesus Christ will let you know of his everlasting love for us. Because Jesus' birth makes your joy complete. Jesus' birth makes us understand that the things in life is going to be temporary. So Jesus' birth and what it means to us is it changes us from this temporary state. It changes us from this state that eventually we're going to lose everything that we've accumulated or still desire to accumulate is going away brothers and sisters live long enough it's going away so this is why we should have joy for christ this is why we should have joy because not only does he save us from our sins and make us upright and live so we can become children of god but he also when being successful through that through sanctification we can be able to have eternal life in the Lord. We can be able to have eternal life with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We can be at the right hand of the Father saying, holy, 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 like the angels that are around him right now. We can be able to thank the Lord for his love for us because we know that not even anything will separate us from the love of God, not even death, not even the trials that you face, not even the concerns that you have in your life right now, not even this pandemic. So brothers and sisters, be encouraged today. Know that the birth of Christ applies to you. Know that whatever you're facing in your life today is not supposed to get you down because what God did through sending Jesus Christ is greater than than anything that we'll ever experience here on earth. Hallelujah. God is good and he's worthy to be praised. So as I close, brothers and sisters, I want you to get a few things from today's message. Not only do we understand that we serve an awesome and great God, we must understand that he has our best interest at heart. We must understand that God loves us greater than we sometimes love ourselves. He wants us to be successful, brothers and sisters. I know that there's some people out there who are stressing out about what kind of gifts they can get somebody. That's superficial. The best thing that you can show somebody is that you love them through the spirit of God. The best thing that you can show someone is that you're there for them. Because if you remember as a kid, when you got that toy that you so wanted so much in your heart, probably after two or three weeks, you get tired of playing with it. <laughs> but when you love Jesus, You can't get tired because of the goodness that God did by sending Jesus to save our soul. You know greater than anyone else the things Jesus coming to earth and being born means to you. Because of the things that you once used to do, you no longer do because of the Holy Spirit that is living in you. And those of you who are still struggling, know that God's grace is sufficient to still help you out with anything that you might be facing. So don't be down today, brothers and sisters. And for those who are doing well, don't be content because there's always another level that God wants you to go to. Because you might be the only Bible, you might be the only spirit that is showing the spirit of Christ that someone who is lost will be able to see. So let them see his spirit resonating in you 
And when they're going through your coworkers and anybody else who may have lost their job or anybody else who may have gone through a divorce or anyone else who may be experiencing health issues or any trial that life can throw at us, they will see the peace that is in your life because you have a relationship with Christ, with God through Christ. So be joyful today, my brothers and sisters. And don't let what you might be facing keep you from being joyful on today. So take a look at this. What I would desire that you could do today is open your spiritual ear so that you can leap for joy about Christ's birth. When you love Christ, that's just automatic. Your spirit leaps and it shows that you appreciate what was done and that Christ's death, burial, resurrection was not in vain. Number two, be joyful and know that Isaiah's prophecy applies to you today. Remember, Isaiah was prophesying about the Israelites repenting but also about their savior coming. So know that Isaiah looked further enough in his prophecy to be able to look at your soul and my soul and everyone's soul and know that they would need a savior. And finally, trust in God's perfect plan. It will come to pass at the fulfillment of time. Hallelujah. God is good, brothers and sisters, and know that anything that God says will come to pass. Now, Isaiah, the prophet, was looking forward to the salvation. And then those who came after were looking back at the cross. <clears throat> In other words, the prophet Isaiah was looking forward to the cross and all those that came after Christ was looking back to the cross after his death, burial, and ascension. Now what are we doing today? We're looking forward to the second coming. Be prepared, brothers and sisters, and know yes. that what was done by Jesus' birth and his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension is going to be something for us to continue to be joyful for when his second coming comes. So be happy today, be joyful today, and I challenge you to let his spirit bring you to tears. Let his spirit bring you to the love that he showed me when I was laying on my back crying because I now truly had a relationship with Christ. Be blessed, brothers and sisters, and we thank you for being with us today. So we thank you again. And um, Pastor Stephanie, I'm going to ask her, as she does the benediction, I'm going to ask her to also um, do a prayer of salvation. I'm sorry I didn't do that, but we're going to go ahead and do that. Thank you all. Amen. Amen. Lord God, we humble ourselves before you right now in this moment, and we yield and surrender to you, Father. We pray in the name of Jesus that if there be any heart listening right now, Lord, that is out of alignment with you, that is not in right relationship, that is not properly connected, that right now, oh Father God, we yield you our heart. We openly surrender, oh Father God, and allow you to enter in. We pray, oh Father God, that you will fill our members, oh Lord God, with your love and that you would allow us to know you, oh Father God, in that intimate way that Pastor described, that we would have the peace, the joy, the love, flood our hearts, Lord. We pray in the name of Jesus that if there has been any confusion in our lives, any um, unbelief in our lives, that you, O oh Lord God, will begin to speak to our spirits by your Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us and direct us. Show us the way, O oh Father God, to have communion with you. We pray, O oh Father God, that uh, we would confess with our mouths, believe within our heart that you did indeed raise Jesus from the dead. That so that, oh Lord God, we may be saved, so that, oh Lord God, we may be reconnected with you, 
and that in this moment, oh Father, if we believe that in our heart, we are saved. And now we pray, oh Father God, that for all of us who have been listening, let us cast all of our cares on you because we know that you cared for us. When you, back in, in the beginning of creation, when you created mankind, you set out already with a plan to redeem us because you knew we would sin and turn away from you. So we thank you, Lord God, for that love. We thank you, Lord God, for that restoration. And we pray in the name of Jesus that we go forth with you in our hearts. In your son Jesus' name, we bless you. Amen. Amen. Merry Christmas to you all. Merry we know that Christmas. you're going to have a great Christmas. Yes, Be joyful. Will. And we love you. And one other thing is we're going to have Bible study this Wednesday. And we're going. We're looking at the covenants that God made with man. Amen. So as he made covenants with Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, and David. We went over God's covenant with man and Abraham this past Wednesday. And so watch for God's covenant with Noah. Come join us, everybody. Amen. We love you. And again, thank you for being a part of service with us today. God Have bless. a blessed